Okay, so next we've got vulnerability functions, trying to consider continuous consequences. So in this case, we're not going to have a probability of a specific outcome. Rather, we're going to have continuous consequences. And we're going to think about computing the probability of exceeding some level, some threshold here. Okay, still be con con conditioned on IM equals X. And usually we're framing this in terms of a, a greater than sign, or it could be greater than or equal to, but continuous random variables, those are the, the equivalent because it's the, it's the severe consequences that are typically of interest to us. And so we can just flip this and say, this is gonna be one minus the CDF for the consequences. Okay, and now the question is, how are we gonna write down an equation for those consequences? And there's lots of different ways to do this, unlike the fragility functions, which are almost always log normal CDFs. This one really varies quite widely. So I'll show you a couple examples of how this can be done. One model, and this gets used for, particularly for predicting like displacements in a building. This is very common if the consequence is a displacement. So we can say the consequence given I am equals X is equal to AX to the B times epsilon. So AX to the B will give us um, some sort of nonlinear function of uh, the I am value. And then epsilon is a random variable. And that's going to give us the, the uncertainty and those consequences, which are typically present. If that epsilon is a log normal random variable, then we end up with uh, kind of a log normal distribution of the consequences. Uh, the median is equal to one typically because we're multiplying. So we're multiplying by a number that's one on average. So it's not systematically pushing us up or down, but it's got some variability. It could be bigger than one or less than one. So it's pushing those consequences up and down. And so the median value is going to be specified by the AX to the B. Then we just multiply by this random perturbation. If that epsilon is log normal, we end up with a function like the one written in the equation here. So we've got back to log of x to functions with standard normal CDFs. And again, we've got some model parameters. So the, the a, the b, and the beta are our model parameters. So a and b are specifying how the consequences vary on average with im. And the beta is giving us that variability, that standard deviation again. So an example plot of that is shown over on the left, where we've as intensity measure is increasing, we've got a mean or a median. So that means when I take a logarithm, the mean is equal to zero. So we've got this function in black, that's the AX to the V function. And then we've got the epsilon that gives us the variability around it. So at some given I am, we've got a log normal distribution that's superimposed here for a, the intensity measure equals one in this case. So the epsilon is pushing us up and down here. Okay, so that's one way that we can do this. Another way that we'll sometimes specify consequences is with a, a beta distribution. And so this gets called like a beta model. So here's a beta distribution probability density function. So the beta distribution is a function that varies in value between 0 and 1. So we've got these kind of model coefficients of the Q and the R. And then this term in the bottom, this is what's called a beta function. So this is just a specific function that normalizes the distribution out to be equal, have an area equal one underneath of it. So Q and R are the model parameters. So the left um, figure is showing this beta distribution plotted out for some different choices of Q and R. So you can see the Q and R values in the legend. In every case, the Outcomes for the consequence are always between zero and one, but for different choices of Q and R, you can end up with outcomes that are more likely to be close to one or more likely to be close to zero or more likely to be in the middle and so on. All right, this is a, a um, popular model when we're dealing with loss ratio. And lo loss ratio is uh, defined as the repair cost of the, the building or the asset divided by its replacement cost. Okay, and so this is a nice, uh, way that we frame consequences very frequently. So that's going to vary between zero and one. If there's no damage, there's no repair cost. So on the lower limit, you're zero. On the upper limit is the damage gets so severe, you're just going to replace the building rather than try to repair it. And so you, the repair cost will equal the replacement cost. So one is the upper bound. So that's nice. Or that's convenient that we've got this bounding. And then in terms of practical implementation, the good thing here is that the loss ratio is independent of the value of the building. So I can come up with a model where I say a minor damage to a housing unit 
that costs on average 5% of the replacement cost of the building to repair. And I don't have to know if it's a small house or a big house. It's just going to be 5% of the replacement cost. Then when I go try to predict the losses to a specific building, I can use that 5% loss ratio prediction and multiply it by the replacement cost of that specific building to get back to a repair cost in dollar units. All right. So let's see, as we think about these consequences and try to link them to the damage states from those fragility functions. So it's often the case that we'll have some discrete damage states. So one thing we can do is try to compute these consequence so we can have a, a model here for consequences given a damage state. Okay, so I just started loosely speaking about the minor damage could be a 5% loss ratio. But more precisely, I could say minor damage has a beta distribution with a, some particular Q and R values that gives me an average of 5%, but it could be above or it could be below. And then I could compute probabilities of any level of loss ratio from this model. And then the right term in this equation, that's going to come from my fragility functions. And that's the type of thing that we were discussing in the previous video. Note that so this calculation here, I'm going to think about probability of each damage state on the right-hand term, the probability of exceeding some level of consequences given that damage state, and then I'll sum up over all my damage states. That's the summation. So this is a total probability theorem calculation. Okay. So on my right-hand side, I've got damage state given IM. The left-hand term, I've got consequence given damage state, sum over all the consequences, and then I'm ending up on the left-hand side of the equation, probability of consequences given IM equals X. Right? So that's back to the general form we're looking for. You know, again, highlight, because we're conditioning on, I, on damage state, I need, on the right-hand term, I need damage state equaling DSI, not exceeding. That's why we have to do that calculation from the previous video. So it's not a greater than or equal to, but we can do that conversion as we discussed. Okay. So we've got this probability of exceeding some level of consequences given IM equals X. Sometimes we just need a mean consequence, like a mean repair cost. That's this bottom uh, equation here. We can do a something similar where at the right hand part of the summation is the probability of damage state equaling DSI. So that part's the same. The left hand side, rather than a probability of exceedance, we can just look at an expected value of the consequences. Rather than uh, on the left hand side of the equation, we'll get an expected value of the consequences rather than a probability of exceedance. So that's another form we'll sometimes use. When mean losses are sufficient, then that's, that's fine. Okay, maybe I'll note briefly that I've got a kind of a summation of i equals one and then i equals zero on these two terms. It doesn't particularly matter which one we use. So I'll note i equals zero typically denotes no damage. And so it doesn't matter whether we include that i equals zero term as long as the consequences are zero. So the probability of no damage is going to be non zero. But if the expected consequences or the probability of exceedance of consequences is zero, then that term will just zero out, and it doesn't matter whether we have it in the summation or not. So sometimes you'll see it with i equals zero, sometimes you'll see it with i equals one. You can see both on this slide, but numerically it's equivalent. Okay, so just to try to put some numbers to one of these things, let's think about this case where we'd looked at a little bit before. I've got on the right-hand side of this table, this is from the fragility function, and these are actual numbers from the fragility functions that we used in the previous video. We did the calculation uh, in that previous video for the 0 0.3, very briefly. So the probability of equaling damage state one, we can do the similar calculations for others. You can try those out if you want to check how it's going. So these probabilities here, they're just indicating the, the probabilities of the various intervals at PGA equals 0 0.5. So we've got five different outcomes. We could have no damage state zero, damage state one, damage state two, damage state three, and damage state four. And those are the five probabilities here that come out of those fragility functions. So I've annotated those visually there. Okay, the other thing we're going to need is expected values of consequences. So these are uh, numbers that also come from Hazus. Okay, so these are going to come from some model. Uh, in, for example, Hazus is one of these common models. I took these from uh, one type of building in Hazus, and they're maybe reasonably intuitive. So remember, i equals zero is no damage, and so the expected consequences are going to be zero in that case. Strictly, they don't need to be, but you know, typically that's what we do. 
minor damage state, I equals one, has a 1% uh, loss ratio. And maybe I should highlight that loss ratio is up in the heading here. So this is our consequence metric of interest in this case. So back to the table. So we see the 1% loss ratio for minor damage, 10% for uh, moderate damage, 41% for extensive damage, and 100% for complete damage. So we're back to the replacement. Okay, so then what I, and I've got repeated, I've got towards the top of the slide here, this expected consequence formula. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the product of the expected consequence and the probability of that damage state. Let's, we'll take the two terms here, take their product. So the, the no damage, the product's equal to zero because there's no consequences. Minor damage, DS1. at 0 0.003 and so forth and then what that formula says up top is we're going to sum all of those up okay in this case i get 0 0.139 and that's telling us that if we get a peak ground acceleration of 0 0.5 g because again the, the fragility function probabilities were all conditioned on that we're going to see on average about 0 0.14 14 percent of the replacement cost of the building that'll be our average uh, loss ratio. And then we could do this calculation for a set of peak ground acceleration values. So as the shaking gets higher, we'll be more likely to be in higher damage states. And so we'll, we'll see more consequences on average. Notice that the expected consequence function is only dependent on the damage state. So it's not dependent on the peak ground acceleration. So as we change the intensity measure level, all we're changing in this model is the probabilities of the different damage states, not the consequences if we got to those damage states. So that's nice, uh, practically speaking, because it means we need fragility functions to relate to ground motion intensity. The consequences just relate to damage. They don't have to additionally consider the ground motion intensity, and that simplifies our models a little bit. Okay, so that's some uh, basic treatment of consequence models and computation of consequences.